everybody. Thank you so much for being with me. You know, I have um, just recently finished a biography of Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt. And um, I've been fascinated by Roosevelt more recently than ever. And uh, was very curious about the New Deal and about his economic policies and particularly how they relate uh, to inflation and everything that we're going through today. So I invited uh, my friend and colleague Harvey Kay, historian and uh, professor emeritus, uh, Harvey Kay. I called him and I said, Harvey, what would, what would Roosevelt do with the inflation crisis that we're going on, this is going through today? What would Roosevelt do? And Harvey very generously said that he would be willing to speak to me about that. And then I thought, well, heck, I bet a lot of people would like to hear from Harvey K about what, oh, I just lost the, I'll be right back. I thought to myself, a lot of people would want to hear what Harvey K uh, had to say about what Roosevelt would do now. So Harvey K is with us. I thought he was going to be off, but now you're on, right? You've been, oh, yeah. on. I don't know if you're off, you're on, whatever. Hi, Harvey, either way. Hi, Hi. Nice it's very nice to join you. I look forward to the day when we actually can sit down in someone's living room, perhaps. I know, but it's so interesting, isn't it? How Zoom has given us a lot more kind of intimacy of conversation. I think COVID has really shown us a lot that can be done. I don't think the world is ever going to quite go back to Zoom as a rarity like it once yeah. was. Ironic, well, not ironically, but I, did ne I never intended to retire from the classroom. I figured I'd be in the classroom until they had to drag me out, right? Mm -hmm. And then because of the pandemic, I didn't want to teach online. And by what, and what I mean by that is, you know, you could get a, a lecture course in which students, you know, would, would not reveal their faces. You know, they would just have their names. Yeah. And I, I can be pretty demanding and, and probably push students, but I couldn't imagine doing it all the time. So I decided I would step out. But fortunately, I end up doing a lot of these conversations and I got yeah. to meet a lot. I actually think I met more people around the country these mm -hmm. last two years mm -hmm. than I had been meeting for some time, really. Well, you're teaching the country. I, I like mean, that, that idea. I like yeah, that. That's, I mean, teaching is a broad term these days and um, your platform is bigger. And I think there's a kind of mass hunger. Uh, I think there's a mainstream hunger for the kind of information that you have, particularly in terms of history. You know, people, a lot of times we don't remember what we learned in the seventh grade or in high school. And in many cases, we didn't learn. Uh, you and I have talked before about yeah. what you and I both see as a crisis. In fact, we have, I think, 11 states in the United States that don't even require half a year of um, uh, schooling in American history, American civics, American government. And, you know, you and I have talked about this, you know, it's very dangerous if people don't learn what the Bill of Rights is, what it means when they're children. They don't know as an adult to be horrified when it's under an assault. Yeah. Um, and I just say to people, I, I had read Love and Politics before the last time we spoke and oh, tweeted you. about my fascination actually for it. I've now read most of the way through, maybe I read all the way through it, I'm forgetting because I've been doing so many things. Um, healing the soul of America. Okay. I will tell you that I, I actually am not pleased when I, I used to hear Biden talk about the soul of America, but it seems to fit you as opposed to him. Well, excuse me. He's, he took the branding. My book came. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Right. Um, but <laughs> what I was going to say is that I, and I know the book is now 20 years from its original publication, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I, I was really amazed. I, I honestly, as I said to you last, I had no idea of your interest in FDR until you, you contacted me. And then I read that, read the book. And I, I actually I was a startled, I mean, decades old, your fascination for FDR, FDR. And it's kind of surprising we somehow hadn't talked before, that's all. Well, yes and no, in terms of surprising, because I think, um, yeah, I have been writing. I mean, I was talking about the corporatocracy in that book at the end of the 1990s, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, oh, I just lost it again. Lauren, would you please get me my earphone? I'm sorry, everybody. Anyway, let's get to it because I know that people are as interested in, uh, as I am. Uh, the reason, and you and I are both fascinated by what happened in the 30s and the 40s and everything that, um, that Roosevelt was about. And I've been also particularly fascinated by Eleanor. However, what I want to talk to you about tonight 
has to do with the relevance of his policies, New Deal, and particularly how he dealt with inflation. So if you could talk to us, I just really want to throw it over to you. Uh, teach us uh, everything that you think we need to know and that would be most helpful for us in terms of FDR and his handling of inflation and whatever other um, attendant issues you think would be good. Okay, and I'll start off in a way, I want to, I'll give the punchline without revealing the punchline completely. Okay. Because <clears throat> when you posed the question to me, what would FDR do? I thought, wow, I, I think I could probably answer that. And then I thought about it and I thought, is it really fair? To, I'm just, is it fair to hold up what he did? Yeah. Okay. Today, when, the, when truly the circumstances are dramatically different. But ultimately, what's interesting about the FDR battle against inflation, his administration and the generation's battle against inflation, is that the way in which he finally beat inflation, because it took a while, even during the course of the war, to do that, is pretty much what he used to win the New Deal from the ground up. And I think that that's, and I, I think I mentioned that last time, that what's really tragic about the Democratic Party, even more in some ways than, than the policies, because they, you know, they, they, they promise and then don't deliver, is that they just don't understand what a truly capital D and small d democratic president and party must be and should be doing. Now explain what I mean by that and then I'll ultimately give you the punchline as the story unfolds. And it's this. So we have, first thing to remember is FDR was president from 33 to four, till his death in 45 and that he won the presidency four times. Okay. And, and that's significant because it's telling us that what he was doing, who he was, what the Democratic Party was accomplishing, despite the opposition they faced, both from Republicans, from big business, and from many within their own ranks, the Southern Democrats in particular, that despite all that, Americans came to trust him, believe him, and were more than willing to fight alongside of him first against the Great Depression, and then against fascism in World War II. Now, when he, took, when he took office, of course, it's the Great Depression, the worst economic and social catastrophe in American history. Unemployment, I mean, unemployment ran, depending on the area and, and, and who you, what community you're referring to, <coughs> anything from 15 to 30 or even higher percent if you were an African-American, especially in the South. So it was just an utter catastrophe. And FDR had told people in the course of his governorship of New York, and he made it clear earlier on, but especially with when the depression hit while he was governor of New York from 28 to uh, 32, that basically America needed to go radical, fairly radical, that's how he put it, fairly radical for at least a generation. And he meant that both in terms of the ways in which we needed to overcome that catastrophe that had befallen the country mm -hmm. and the world in many ways, but also because he feared that if Americans did not fully experience democracy in their lives, they might well resort to fascism or communism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I say that, you know, people <clears throat> on the left sometimes say, oh, communism would have been great. You know, that, you know, utterly oblivious to the realities of, of, of communism under Stalin and the Soviets, et cetera, et cetera. But also it's the case that FDR had a far more radical vision, perhaps, and that was he saw the American story itself as a revolution. However much he may have skated over the, the dark side of American history, the point was he saw this as, as the founders, for all of their faults and failings, saw it as a great experiment, a grand experiment. And indeed, he saw that experiment truly in crisis at that time for the lack of vision and leadership afforded, especially by the Republicans, but also by Democrats who preceded him. So what did it mean for him to say, we're going to go radical? Now, keep in mind, so in the Depression, he's facing what we would think of as deflation. Okay, prices had collapsed, people right. had no money to spend. So keep in mind, the battle against the Depression was a battle against deflation, you might say. And then the battle against fascism is, is, is going to entail massive inflation problems and how and, and addressing that. So, but in the 30s, what does he do? Well, 
in addition, as you know, everyone says, well, he went big and he created these big programs and he mobilized the labor and energies of Americans. And that's, that in itself was fundamental. Americans became engaged through their own labors, whether it had to do with the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration, the, the Rural Electrification Administration. I mean, there are these innumerable agencies, they were called the alphabet soup agencies, but people became engaged in them. And in essence, they themselves, as he regularly reminded them, especially in the late 1930s, they're the ones he would constantly tell them who brought them out themselves out of the depression. But here's the other thing about it. And this to me is the thing that too often people forget, the pundits forget this. He not only empowered American working people the labor put to work to fight not only not only the need for better infrastructure, but also the, the environmental catastrophe that had struck. By the way, not only the, the drought that struck the Plain states, but if you came out to the Midwest and even further west, what you would have found quite often on, in farming areas was soil erosion, hillsides. So, I mean, he really did address the environment. And, and so Okay, that's an empowerment. But here's the other thing. He also empowered them in a, in a way that it required him to sign off first in the National Industrial Recovery Act on the right of workers to organize unions and bargain collectively. And then because companies found their way around that law, they set up company unions, okay, which was completely different model than FDR and Robert Wagner, the senator of New York, had ever intended, though at first it seemed like it was a revolution. Labor leaders called it the Magna Carta of labor back in 1933, later to discover it wasn't quite the Magna Carta. Okay? <clears throat> but in 1935, he signed into law the National Labor Relations Act, which really not only, look, workers were already mobilizing and organizing based on what had happened in 33 with the National Industrial Recovery Act. But in 35, it was his answer to their need to have the government stand behind their efforts. That is, the government itself, by way of the National Labor Relations Board, would not act as an arbiter or a mediator. They would come in and guarantee workers the right to organize. And millions organized. And that included not only white workers, it was black workers, it was women workers, all of which would, would increase manifold during World War II, which I'll come to. So when you look at the 30s, you ask yourself, well, how, how did he fight the depression? What did they do? And how did they fight deflation? Well, one, by creating jobs, but also by empowering workers themselves who were, who were slowly but surely making their way back into the factories, back into the fields, et cetera. The only sad <clears throat> part of it was in the 30s, agricultural workers were not covered by the National Labor Relations Act, which was pretty much a racist thing imposed upon the law by the Southern Democrats. Okay, so that's the fight versus deflation. There's what I've, what I've read amongst most economic historians that around 1940, the war has already begun in Europe. It's already begun in East Asia, but the war is underway everywhere except the United States is not directly involved. But already, already we're shifting because of the revival of domestic industry on top of that, FDR himself began to rev up what we would call the defense industries. Mm -hmm. People were getting jobs. They were making money. All of a sudden they had money to spend. And let's not forget, millions of workers are now organized in labor unions. They're making more money than they ever would have in the past when they didn't have unions, okay? So FDR didn't take much to figure it out, but FDR knew from what he was witnessing that as the war approached the United States, the question would be how to fight in a totally different fashion, inflation. Now that required a number of, I mean, there's a whole series of initiatives. And I can tell you that first of all, they had to figure out a way to take money out of the system, but not necessarily, right. okay. So they had to let, in other words, they had to reduce immediate demand. Right. So they had already in the FDR had already in the, in the 30s signed on to, to tax laws that raised taxes on the rich. But most Americans did not pay income taxes. 
middle and work, especially working class people didn't pay income taxes. But now workers were doing much better than they had been doing. And he had to somehow reduce their capacity to consume mm -hmm. if they were going to effectively. Notice I haven't even mentioned the Federal Reserve. It never comes into the story, basically, as far as the, the fight against inflation, which is a what in the last number of what, 20 years or 30 years we've seen, 30 years, maybe we've seen this all handed over to the Federal yeah, Reserve. Yeah, just handed over to them. Yeah. Okay, so first was in terms of taxing, and, and they, they pursued that. Ever again, the rich were going to pay more taxes and corporations were going to pay taxes. Now, the next thing was they still needed to pull money out of the system because they didn't want to, you know, taxes, they didn't want to go overboard necessarily. But they decided they also knew that with the war coming, they needed monies for def the defense pro programs. So they began the sale of originally defense bonds and then it became war bonds. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's interesting. I assume <clears throat> that savings bonds are still readily available, though they're not like when I was a kid. When I, when I was a kid in the, in the 60s, any kid I knew who was getting some kind of special event in their life as a teenager, say, as I was Jewish, it was, it was a bar mitzvah. Mm -hmm. Savings bonds were not an unusual gift to give a kid. But of course, the people buying them were the, the folks who had come through the Great Depression and World War II. It's, it made yeah. sense to them. Buy a savings bond at $18.75. Yeah. Eventually, it'll come due at $25. And what FDR said is, look, think about it. You can buy these savings bonds and you'll be guaranteed at the war's end, there'll be this additional money that, that you'll receive. Now, basically, these efforts were important. And now here's the thing to consider. It isn't just the demand that's great. It's also, it isn't just that. He has to figure out once we get further and further into this process. And it was in December of 1940 that he calls for the United States to become the arsenal of democracy. Right. Now that means that whatever the efforts before to enhance America's defense industries are now going to be magnified. We're now going to not only sort of build up the American military, we're going to guarantee certain deliveries to Britain and its allies against the Germans. So whether it's the good, the, you know, the things that go into to create making clothes, the things that go into making tanks, all of these raw materials, all of these that are going to be turned into war materials, they're going to have to come from somewhere. They're going to, you're not going to get new automobiles. You're not going to be able to, they, I, I, was, I listened to a radio show recently and they said that, and I had completely forgotten that men would no longer have, you know, vested suits. Okay. They're, they would no longer have cuffs on their pants. So all, all of these minor little things to make sure that, I mean, you're talking billions of pairs of socks and clothing and all this to, to outfit the military eventually and other militaries. So you, you get the, you get this, this, this need to fight inflation all the more. In 1941, the United States is already in a kind of build up to a war. I think I said to you last time, the Four Freedom speech of, 19, of January 41 is not only a speech in which FDR offers the vision of a world beyond the war marked by freedom of speech and expression, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Those last two were strikingly radical visions. It, it's the case that he's also warned Americans that, look, the fascists aren't going to tell us when they're going to attack. And he knew they were going to eventually attack. So here he is trying to encourage Americans to understand the crisis they're in and the crisis that's coming. And inflation is already rising at, you know, for lack of a better metaphor, at an unhealthy rate. Mm -hmm. And later in that year, I get it was in it was in the course of 1941 that they began to talk about price ceilings, oh, that's interesting. price ceilings, and they created the Office of Price Administration. However, I should make clear, when the Office of Price Administration was first created, it had no authority to impose penalties. It was more like, a, like these, are the, these are the things we need you to do. And of course, a number of the big companies actually did follow suit. They had, they had war contracts. They didn't want to maybe jeopardize their, con their war contracts. But it was the case. Inflation just kept rising. Well, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 
December of 1941. And the United States is having a very, very difficult time at first, um, mostly because we were in part caught off guard by, by what happened in the Pacific, but also because the Germans had already taken all of the continent of Europe and are, and are, and are all over North Africa. So what I, I want to... I, I look back today to see there was a speech FDR gave in the spring of 1942. And he speaks very honestly to Americans about what the government will need to do to assure that the war effort is a winning war effort. And he, what he says is it's not only a matter of the men we recruit and the armies we field, it's a matter of how we outfit them. It's a matter of how we enable them to pursue that, that. And it, he gave a speech. First, he, gave, he delivered a speech to Congress. Later, he offered it as a fireside chat. It, his chief of staff titled the Seven Point Stabilization Program. You're going to forgive me. I'm going to read it because this is so characteristic, characteristically FDR. He, he knew how to make people re, at least remember the theme. He said, to keep the cost of living from spiraling upward, we must tax heavily. And I'm giving you the shorthand version. I'm not going to give you the whole thing. Great to hear our president say we must tax heavily. Right. <laughs> we to, hear that today. Yeah. <laughs> to keep the cost of living from spiraling upward, <coughs> we must fix ceilings on the prices which consumers and retailers and wholesalers and manufacturers pay for the things they buy. Three, to keep the cost of living from spiraling upward. He's got this the spiraling upward in the speech. You can almost eventually you'll cut, you almost imagine it. OK, we must stabilize the remuneration received by individuals for their work. To keep the cost of living from spiraling upward, we must stabilize the prices received by growers for the products of their lands. To keep the cost of living spiraling upward, we must encourage all citizens to contribute to the cost of winning this war by purchasing war bonds. To keep the cost of living from spiraling upward, we must ration all essential commodities. Notice the word ration. And then he says, to keep the cost of living from spiraling upward, we must discourage credit and installment buying. Okay, I, I, that, that seventh one, I have less familiarity with it because I'm more familiar with the, the, the other steps that were taken. But anyhow, inflation kept going up. Okay, I mean, the American war effort was already well underway. There was no question about the fact that this was truly the arsenal of democracy. We had, an, an, if you like, a, a, a defense and war machine that was unmatched really a, around the world. But the rationing did come. And that meant that you were, got, you were given a ration book with coupons, okay? And it's, inter it's interesting because the Richard Wolf, who I know you've interviewed and, mm -hmm. and spoken with, Richard um, recently pointed out a very interesting observation. He said, uh, sort of echoing Marx, that the ration books were distributed basically on the basis of need. So if you had more children, you had more ration points in order to buy milk for the family. So it was done very, very carefully. Now, one thing I haven't mentioned, and I'm going to get to that, is the degree to which the Office of Price Administration, which was handling all of these affairs with some other agencies involved as well, was headed by um, Leon Henderson, who was a decidedly progressive New Dealer, who recruited staff who were progressive. And basically, they understood their task in such a way as to make sure that what they were doing favored working people and not big business. Right. Okay. And this will what come up. What called the economic royalists. Yes. The, right. Exactly. You're not going to do this to favor the economic royalists. Um, the next thing, they, the, the next thing, and this is interesting as part of this sort of uh, process, is that how do you control for wages if you're trying to favor working people? So this is what they did. So the the, the, the big unions, the, both the American Federation of Labor Unions and the Congress of Industrial Organization Unions promised no strikes during the war. Oh, that was a pledge, no strikes. In return for which the government um, had, it was an understanding, it was called, a, a, it originally was called maintenance of membership, later called maintenance of voluntary membership. <clears throat> what it meant is this, if you took a job in a war plant, and they were all organized, right? It, 
Mm -hmm. If you took a job in a war plant, you were automatically enrolled in the union. You had two weeks to drop out. You didn't have to be in the union. You had two weeks to drop out. Beyond that, you're in because then the contract mm -hmm. takes hold. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that not a lot of workers dropped out. Okay. I mean, the fact was that they needed, workers recognized they needed the union. The hours in the war plants were long, very stressful. There were constant orders to, to do speed ups. By the way, there were wildcat strikes during yeah. the war. Uh, unions did not sanction them, but what happened was workers reached the point where they were overworked. They literally mm -hmm. downed tools and walked out and probably walked out for no more than a day. In one, so, but the idea was to let the bosses know there's a limit, that kind of thing. OK, now the, I should also have mentioned there was corruption around rationing. There were folks tried to you know, get around it. There was a black market for it. Um, but in any case, the government did not retreat from these initiatives. And now we come to a really crucial thing. It's already late 1942. We've been in the war really for only about a year, but inflation remained, a, fighting inflation remained a top priority. And this is what I really, this is the moment where you really see a Roosevelt administration. And, that, and here's what they did. First of all, they got a law secured to truly empower the Office of Price Administration. That's first of all, okay? They could actually set the prices. They could control the prices. But on top of that, the question was, well, how do you enforce them? So here's what they did. The Office of Price Administration set up 5,000 plus, it was 5,025 little OPAs. In other words, small OPA offices all over the country. And they were, they were, well staffed, but not staffed well enough to, to, to effectively do the job. So then they, they rallied civic organizations, especially women's organizations. And, the, and they rallied these people to become the eyes of the OPAs. They would literally set these volunteers would go into stores and make sure the prices were what they were supposed to be. So um, yeah, sorry, I'm going on a bit. So I have, yeah. I have, no, I just have a question about this issue of setting prices. Yeah. They actually use governmental authority. I'm just thinking about gas and food prices today. Yes, yes, You're they did. You're saying they actually, so what, what was the governmental authority that was granted at that time? And was that only because it was an emergency basis because of the war? Um, I mean, what authority did he have well, the, the, that Biden the law doesn't have or doesn't actually Biden did have, have congressional Congress had authorized these initiatives. The the act, and, and did it and then did they sunset out? I mean, like there was an emergency price control the, act. OK, oh, yeah. So hold on a minute. So okay. you're saying that the that the Congress passed an emergency price control act. That's yeah. fascinating. Or Price Stabilization Act. Okay. Sometimes so theoretically, me. Congress could do that today with. Well, the yeah, law. I mean, absolutely. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about the chutzpah that was that was evident in government yeah, now here, policy. And here's, here's where we come to what I said was the punchline, because to me, this is what makes a Roosevelt presidency. Mm -hmm. So they had. Around the country, 250,000 people working. With the Office of Price Administration, I, I don't have the division carefully down, but there were quite a few paid staff, but believe me, the greater majority of folks involved would have been the volunteers from women's, not only women's organizations, but especially women's organizations that policed the prices and then reported to the OPA and then action could be taken on that. Now, I also want to make something clear. There was a great deal of government, you know, propaganda, government enthusiasm. I left out, you know, the fact that when the war bonds were being sold, they launched during the war a whole series of war bond drives. And people may remember some of yeah. the, the, the Four Freedoms <laughs> paintings by Norman Rockwell. Those Four Freedoms paintings traveled to 26 cities and were placed on display in whatever the, you know, in, in either a public or in a major department store. Celebrities would turn out and thus they sold. Yeah. I, again, the figures war. escape me right now. Yeah, the war bonds. By the way, kids would buy 
war, war stamp, they were stamps they would put in these savings books and eventually they could then cash them in for an actual war bond. But what I'm getting at is that it was this, it was this kind of activity, this small d democratic activity, which you know a lot of people would say, well, that sounds like something the Cubans would have done. Well, sure as hell. Okay, the fact is that if you're in a crisis and you have to sustain the economy and you don't want the rich, and by the way, I mean, this was a way in, amongst many others of redistribution during the war. They held down profits and left out little things along the way because they didn't want to take it. But for example, when FDR called for those seven steps, he actually called for a cap on income. Of, he said, no one should be, he didn't think anyone should be allowed to make more than $25,000 a year during this period of time. Now, he didn't get that to my knowledge, okay? But, he, but when he gave a speech like that, now admittedly, that was a lot of money to, to, to the vast majority of people, but at least he knew, he knew that he'd be willing to welcome their hatred again, you might say, as he did in 1936. So, you know, and by the way, this whole effort in 43 and 44, it did work. That's when inflation was capped. It was called, and most people call it the hold the line period because FDR issued what he called the hold the line order to really make it effective. And okay. there was a, there were, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just, I want to make sure that we get some of the big themes that we yeah. don't miss out on really marking what the big themes are here. Because you keep talking about a small, this is democratic economics, small yeah. D democratic economics. And I know in, in the speech when he was accepting the nomination uh, for the democratic nomination the second time, he said, or maybe it was in his inauguration the second time, he said that his first administration would be known for having pushed back the forces of greed and <laughs> lust for power. Um, he never stopped acknowledging um, these economic royalists. Today, they would be seen as these huge corporate forces, but really the same overreach by capitalism, um, an overreach by which yeah, forces right. which make Absolutely. private property right. their, their god, basically, uh, do so at the expense of the working people of the United States. The, the, the other thing about that is that it seems to me that we have lost our capacity to respond to emergencies. He knew he had an emergency on his hand. The, the yeah. depression was an emergency. The war was an emergency. And today, we should see what's happening now as an emergency. It is an emergency in the lives of the uh, vast majority of working people in the United States. And so the fact that he would even be talking about capping prices, I mean, when you look at the enormous profits of the oil companies right now, enormous multi-billion dollar profits, and they are just prowse gadget. That's all that they're doing. And all they're getting from President Biden is a, you know, a letter saying, you guys really shouldn't do that. And that's where the question comes in. And of course, you know, we can't know what he would do today. And I think you're right to point out it, men, many of the conditions are the same, are, are different. But the attitude that he took about these things, standing unequivocally in order to advocate for Americans who were suffering and pushing back, you know, how he would say the progress of a nation is not how much you do for those who already have a lot. The progress of a nation is what you do for those who do not yet have enough. Right. And, and I, I, two things that before I forget, Mm -hmm. One, in, in regards to all of these efforts, there was a consumer activist. The consumer movement in the 20s and 30s, and I'm sure you figured this out by your reading about Eleanor, uh, was, was also very close to the labor movement. It, was, it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't a, a nadir type of consumer movement. It was a, a literally a, a, a movement from the ground up regarding housewives demanding <laughs> proper pricing and everything else. Well, there, one of the activists in that, a woman named Carolyn Ware, wrote a book early in the war. I think it was 42. I read the book. It was great. I actually bought a copy. I couldn't resist. called Consumers Go to War. Consumers and in there she, go to war. And, or the consumer goes to war, something like that. But the point was, she, she was brought in by this Leon Henderson. She was brought in to head up what they called the consumer division of the Office of Price Administration. She was responsible for mobilizing these organizations literally to police pricing. And she talked about all of those activities as what a democratic economy could be built upon. Right. I mean, her, her, she, the, she was very much impressed by the, the idea that the war effort would show that freedom from want and freedom from fear could be pursued. 
Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's where, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, I just that I don't want to stop you either. I, I, you know, first of all, there's that whole idea of price policing. I mean, that would be such anathema to the conservatives. That would be such anathema, even to the neoliberals today, uh, you know, talk about calling how they called him a socialist. I mean, yeah. today, what right. that very concept would get, um, wasn't there something when, the, when the uh, consumer protection office was first set up during the Obama years. And I know Elizabeth Warren, who had been so much behind, uh, it's establishment oh, yeah. that he wouldn't let her have the job because he knew that she'd go, she'd try to do too much with it. Am I right? That could well be. I mean, I, I I never heard her specifically talk about popular policing, but no, I don't think she ever went that far. <laughs> no, that we are talking about Elizabeth Warren. I, what did she say? I'm a yeah, pastor. right, whatever. Right, another, but she another, certainly was saying yeah. the government should be looking out for the consumer, and for today's world, that of itself is almost a radical notion. Yeah, you know, some other things I want to point out, just as side notes to these, is for example, on the control of wages, <laughs> uh, workers were still workers were actually doing quite well. In, in during the war period, um, you know. The, the, the biggest complaint of the war period what quite probably wasn't even the rationing. It was the amount of, t- of the stress in the workplace that workers were experiencing. But here's the thing to consider. With all of this democratic energy, not only expended by, by the troops overseas fighting fascism, mm-hmm. but here at home, mm-hmm. this is the kind of, of this is the kind of experience that did lead Americans. Remember, I, I think I mentioned this last time in 1943. By the way, this is all happening within months of each other. That's the funny thing. It seems so long ago. So we might imagine there was taking place over a long period of time. But it was in 42. That, that was the inflation crisis. So at the end of the year. They issued the hold the line orders and the OPA was was net better authorized to pursue price controls. And it's in 43 that it worked. Boom. Right. Well, similarly, in the course of 43, as so many Americans were involved in these kinds of activities, and indeed inflation was controlled, when FDR commissioned the surveys and polls to ask Americans what they wanted after the war, they were convinced that they they wanted everything because they knew they could do it. Okay. Yeah, Sorry. I want to ask you about that. Uh, yeah. First of all, I want to go back to this a little bit. You know, when you were saying you, you said several times that women were going into the stores and policing the prices, right? And they would report back to the government office. Yeah. Well, first of all, today you wouldn't need that because it would be online. People, we would know what people were <laughs> yeah, charging. Right. But also, right. I have to say, there's something creepy about that. I mean, you know, Greg Youngkin, the, the governor in, in um, Virginia, has put out a hotline. And if your child is learning critical race theory, you can call and tell on the teacher. The whole idea of Americans telling on somebody to the government, that has a little bit of a creepy sound to it. Even though I know the context you were talking about was cool, still the whole thing was creeping me out a little bit when you were. Um... I, as I said to you, there are times where I, I read about this and I think, wow, in the wrong yeah. hand, in the wrong <laughs> hands. In the wrong but, hands. But keep exactly in mind, right. this is, and this is what people need to remember. In mm-hmm. the 1930s, Americans became the most progressive generation. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so so let's go there for a minute because you, yeah. you, you were talking about the four freedoms and the second two were freedom from, not just freedom for, but freedom from fear and freedom from want. And I know um, that Eleanor and Franklin and others around them were already knowing, you know, the war is gonna end. We have to be thinking about this country at the end of the war. And Franklin Roosevelt did that thing that you've already mentioned here. He brings the people in and he said to people, what do you want at the end of the war? And they wanted everything and he right. wanted to give it to them. They want a free college. They want it. And he was able to do the GI Bill was as far as he could get. But of course, right. that was hugely successful in creating the post-war middle class. Right. right. And we should let pe- we should remind people yeah. 16 million Americans served in uniform. Mm-hmm. 12 million Americans enjoyed the benefits of the GI Bill. Right. And, and by the way, the population of the United States at that time was, was 130 half. million. Yeah. So that was not it was not necessarily but approaching what one of every 10 Americans. They wanted free health care, which he wanted right. to give to them. Right. Uh, what else did they want? Job with a living wage. Everybody, right. A guaranteed, guaranteed job. Right. Um, I got the. You know, it's funny. This I actually have the surveys behind then. me. <laughs> I hope everybody's really listening to us on this. This is what Americans expected. And they had a president that wanted to give it to them. You know, I 
put up online the other day, Harvey. I think if, if um, Bernie Sanders had won the presidency in 2016, not only do I think he'd still be president, but I think the Democrats would be so popular for the next 50 oh. years, given <laughs> what he would do and what people would be so happy that he was doing. Yeah. So because of, course, of their enthusiasm and what right. they they want, they wanted, that was what led FDR. I mean, keep in mind, this is all in a short period of time. Right. And so it's in January of 44 that, by the way, this is the funny part is it wasn't that long before that that he told the journal, he told journalists in a news conference, my job, you know, I was Dr. New Deal in the thirties. Now it's, I'm, you know, Dr. War. I've got to win the war. You know, we have, to, and he was willing, he sort of implied, you know, you put certain things aside. Well, it was probably in pretty short order that he then comes before Congress in January 44 and calls for an economic bill of rights right. to do all the things, to guarantee all the things that Americans have just told him, yes, this is what we want. So it was, so it was wily about, in his own way, very wily, you might say. So well, he was that way. And he would, his relationship with Eleanor regarding those things, she'd come, as I'm sure you're very aware, uh, she would bring all these progressive activists yep. that she wanted him to meet. And right. he would say, I don't have time to meet them. So he didn't, she'd invite them to dinner. She'd, she'd, he'd be a captive audience. And he'd say, yeah, you know, and he'd be kind of ornery around it. And you're asking for too much, you're asking for too much. And then he'd give a speech where he actually was asking for the things that she had right. been that's to, right. Right. And the Economic Bill of Rights would certainly be an example of the kind of domestic agenda that she was looking forward to post-war. Tell us what he wanted in the Economic Bill of Rights. It seems to me, and I'd, I'd like to know if you agree, what we need right now is an Economic Bill of Rights. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is the case that he lays out, I should probably have gotten my, my copy of the Economic Bill of Rights here, because it really was basically that housing homes would be guaranteed. Okay. okay. Homes guaranteed. Hear Homes that, guaranteed. Everybody? Homes okay. guaranteed. Or we could say in those days it would have said housing. Okay. Yeah, housing. Which is actually, is um, that what's You know what? It is I should just today. hold on a second. Let, you know what? Housing is guaranteed. Walls were in a live thing. Let um, me get... Jobs are guaranteed. Yeah. Jobs are guaranteed. <laughs> Health care is guaranteed. Health care. And by the way, the term they used to use back in those days in the American mind was the. Um, Universal health care, that's how they refer to it. In fact, I was kind of disappointed that, I mean, it was a clever idea for Bernie and others to say Medicare for all, but actually I, I wanted people to say universal health care. Yeah, okay? that's what I Period. said too. Okay, because mm -hmm. you're still paying, by the way, we're still paying for Medicare. Yeah, we're, I mean, <laughs> absolutely, which prices okay. have gone up. Okay, so college for all, universal health care, jobs for all guaranteed and housing for all guaranteed. Right. Uh, geez, I'm embarrassed. I have to look this up. Doosh. OK, I mean, well, also, they wanted to they wanted to guarantee farmers a fair a fair return. They okay. also said they were willing to, you know, he said we're going to guarantee. Um, and does it, people in industry a fair return? OK, it, this was not a socialist argument. No, but I will make something clear. There is a term we don't use in this country, and I think it's really, really unfortunate when FDR pursued what came to be called liberalism in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. He had literally radically transformed the meaning of liberalism. It's FDR and his administration that changed the meaning of liberalism. From what to what? Well, of course, classical liberalism, which goes back to the 18th century, generally referred, I have to put this in historical context, it meant liberating people from governments and churches liberating them, not to be subject to the authoritarianism of, the, of in most cases, the Catholic Church and the, the, the authority of a monarchical and aristocratic mm -hmm. government. So liberalism mm -hmm. was to free up, to liberate. Yes, to Western liberalism as a general concept. As it, right. So liberalism always had this idea of liberation from government. So in fact, in some ways, laissez-faire economics was, a, was liberalism. It was a Western liberal idea, I hear. Right. Now over yeah. in Britain, the liberal party was already shifting gears in a more social, it didn't become social democratic, but it was moving in our language to the left because the labor party emerged in Britain and challenged the strength and leadership of the Liberal Party. And for a while, they even used to do what they call Lib Lab coalitions and all that, but it's the Labor Party then emerged. So here in this country, 
FDR, who, by the way, was in regular contact with British left intellectuals. Mm -hmm. And he, and he wasn't necessarily going to go so far as to create a Labour Party, FDR, but he was going to turn the Democratic Party into a truly liberal party as he saw it. And what that meant is, and he quoted Lincoln very effectively, you know, Lincoln was the one who said, government, government does what we cannot do for ourselves. In other words, when we need to act collectively, or if you like, in a solidarity-like way, we use government to pursue those ends. And FDR quoted that. Some journalists had asked FDR, so what are your politics? And he said, well, I'm a Christian and I lean left of center. That's how he put it. But for most people in that day, other than the socialists or the communists and others, he was moving pretty much to the left. So what he was doing is he was using government in the same way the social democratic parties over in Europe were, were beginning to do so, using government to empower workers, okay, to basically countervail, as John Kenneth Galbraith would say, countervail the power of capital, what FDR himself called the titans of industry, and later, as you like to say it, and I do too, the economic royalists. Mm -hmm. That's what social democracy would do. It would lift people up from the, from the bottom up and empower, not in a charity-like way, but by empowering them and enabling them, okay? But at the same time, regulating the bosses, okay? And empowering the workers. It's this real process that he was trying to pursue. And you could see it all the way through the 30s. So indeed, this is exactly the way in which he ends up pursuing the war effort. He made certain sacrifices. Um, he, he compromised with big business so that much of the war effort at the plant level and so on was run what they, by what they called the dollar a year man, corporate executives who would leave their positions in the corporation and take a job in the war effort for $1 a year. The disadvantage is that by the end of the war, business had gotten a better reputation because of these kinds of things. But you got to win a war, you got to win a war. The more that was secondary to the fact that after the war, FDR was not there. Truman was not quite up to the task. Mm -hmm. Just as he warned in the Economic Bill of Rights speech, he warned about rightist reaction. Mm -hmm. By the way, I, I read something, and maybe you read it in the Eleanor and, and uh, Franklin biography already. The man who warned him about rightist reaction was apparently Bernard Baruch, one of the wealthiest mm -hmm. men in the country. He warned of right wing reaction, not from the likes, say, of the Klan or, you know, the, the folks to today would be QAnon and all. That. No, from the economic royalists themselves. They would try Koch to. Brothers. He foresaw yeah. the Koch brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I mean, it's a, it was the main thing that I try to tell people, you know, people say, well, you got to go big. That's what FDR did. Well, you have to go big. Yeah. But the other thing is you have to engage and empower your fellow citizens. You have to they have. There's a great speech he gave in 1938 on the campaign trail in Cleveland, Ohio. And in this speech, he literally talks to his audiences, and this is characteristic of him saying, you did this, you did this, okay? Right. And, you know, it's a device, but it's a very, but it's a device that's reflective of what people themselves knew they had done. Well, in many ways, he give, yes, they created those jobs, but then they did do them. Right. And I think the war effort, because it was perceived to be a righteous war, very differently than some of the modern wars that we've, uh, of the last few years, people did feel that they were joined in an effort to save democracy from fascism. And there was legitimacy to that. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> uh, great legitimacy absolutely. to that. So. Where we are left, it seems to me, in wrapping this up, you've been so generous. Um, when you were just talking about people say we have to go big, and you said it's not just that we have to go big, it's that we have to include people in the effort. That's true, because that was not a time when politics was the spectator sport that it's been turned into today. The political establishment today, it seems to me, is actually vested in people not feeling that they can participate. That's part of the sleight of hand. Give us your power and let us 
uh, do for you, this very paternalistic um, system. And most of the time they're really not. And it seems to me, um, it's not just whether or not you go big, it's the purpose of government. And right now, what we don't have is a major political party unequivocally and unabashedly advocating for the well being, the safety, health, and the well being of the working people of the United States. Yeah, and that's I, what he was yeah. perceived to be, correct? Yes. And I, and I was going to say, I remember something else a little while ago. I was going to say, <laughs> we were talking about um, in crises and so on. I, even now, as you were saying that, I thought to myself, it, isn't it inconceivable that in the midst of a pandemic, the Democratic Party could not find it in itself to say, we're in an emergency, we must have Medicare for all. He could expand, he could declare a medical emergency and expand Medicare to everyone. He could do it tonight. He, uh, that's right. And, and he um, could declare an, a, a climate emergency, which it is, and, and put on a warp speed plan for the transition to um, transition to green energy. You know, it's so interesting because those of us, you know, you've, you've pointed out here so effectively tonight that during World War II, it was a far more progressive America. It was progressive population. It was a progressive presidency. Yeah. And so many times with the corporatist Democrats, the elite establishment corporate Democrats today, they act like the progressives are trying to hijack the party. They hijack the party. <laughs> They're the ones who hijack the party. We're Eleanor and Franklin, and they are the Duponts and the Morgans. <laughs> Absolutely. No, no, absolutely. And um, I mean, another time we can talk about when the party was hijacked. I have that story to tell, too. I assume you're thinking 1990s, Bill Clinton, Democratic No, I'm thinking Council. 1970s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there, there were failings before then, but especially there's a there's a key year, 1978, but it's already begun before then. But 1978. And then once Reagan got there. That's just to whet everyone's appetites for a later conversation. Yeah, for another conversation. <laughs> because right now I've said often that I think of the Republicans right now as um, uh, just a nosedive for our democracy. But I think of the Democrats as a managed to decline. And it just, I don't see the status quo disrupting itself. And the kind of disruption we need is a return to uh, a Rooseveltian uh, willingness to use uh, the powers of government on behalf of the people. Yeah, I, you know, I, a couple of weeks ago, Bernie spoke about the Democrats seeming to be, you know, like go, he didn't use this metaphor, but like lemmings, right, go, heading to the to the cliff. And he said, you know, the Democrats need we need something like Gingrich. He actually said Gingrich style contract with America. Okay, well. Now should be the time. Now it should the be the moment. time where basically you start talking about, and you'll excuse me, I'm going to promote again the economic bill of rights idea, but <clears throat> this should be the time, yeah. right? I think so. I think so. And yeah. I think that the main point is one of the reasons it's the time is because people see through this. People get it. People get this neoliberal canard. Yeah. that both parties are, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a chokehold on our democracy. It's a chokehold on the, uh, on the um, economic rights and abilities um, of the majority of Americans and people see it. So I don't know, I think there's a miracle coming. I think there's a, um, there's a term in sociology, local discontinuity of progress. You never know where it's going to come from, but it's so interesting when you see moments in history where it's counterintuitive. You know, on one hand, people talk about how the system is so locked up, and it is. The system yeah. on, a, on a material plane, economically, technologically, governmentally, politically, it's something's locked up. And I understand people's frustration, anger with that. But those are often the moments when because it's locked up, people are going <laughs> and are open. So I think that voices like yours are so important, Harvey, because we need oh, to hear, you. well, what would be the alternative vision? You know, what did they do before? What is possible? And uh, everybody, I'm, uh, I, I know that you join with me in being very grateful to Harvey Kay for talking about what happened at one period of time in our country where we were in trouble and we got out of the trouble with a progressive vision pushing back 
against uh, overreach by capital. Yeah, you know, and, uh, that's what we need to I, do. Now. I won't keep people long with this, but here's the thing to think about. So in 1943, when FDR asked Americans what they wanted, they basically said everything. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, we already, and, we're, and we have been so trained. I, it, it but wait, but wait, mind. but wait. If when people are asked, would should we have Medicare for all? They say the majority yes. Say yes. Vast majority. Should, Vast majority should, says, should all jobs provide a living wage? Yes. Yes. Should all students be able to secure free public education all the way through college? Yes. 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 I mean, yes. you know, should all they, Americans be able to yes. secure a house or a home at least? Exactly. Or a exactly. So we've exactly. got it. We just don't have the political leadership. That's right. That's right. Because the, 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 it, there is such institutional resistance to giving people what they want, to giving people what they deserve, to giving people what in other advanced democracies, Western democracies, it's just what the average American gets, but the is the average citizen gets. But today, people have been trained to expect too little. But when you ask them what they want, what you just said, they they want it all. And why shouldn't we have it all in a country which theoretically belongs to the people? Right. You and I think so. I think Absolutely. a lot of the people will be listening to us. <laughs> you know, I think we're preaching to the choir here. But uh, <laughs> that's okay. The no, but it's we- important for people to know that. If there are people watching who don't realize that they're not alone, that's a start. That's right. You know, that's if they right. realize, you mean to say other people really believe this? Well, yeah. Yeah. That and is moreover, really moreover, next time a politician says we're the richest nation on earth, hold them to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if you've got uh, such a massive transfer of wealth into the hands of a very few, you know, then oh. those riches are clearly yeah. not right. Uh, not being um, the opportunities are not being distributed in any way universally. Harvey K, I think you're incredible. I, I love you. I want everybody to remember this one is called FDI on FDR. FDI FDR <laughs> on democracy. But he also wrote Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. I hope you'll uh, come back and talk to me sometime about Thomas Paine. I would love absolutely. that. Absolutely, well, absolutely, my my hero, my true hero. Now he's the one who said we have it in our power in power the power to, to begin start the world. the world again. Yes, right. He's the one. You bet. I was reading about him the other night. I, I was, you know, I always am fascinated by these men and their women and his wife. And I don't know. I just always want to know who is yeah, married not, to. I mean, his relationship. Women, oh, was, his yeah, relationship with women was a tragic one. Yeah, it was. Yeah, really it tragic. Was. Um, it was. And he, I, he, but we never know how it, men of those days, other than John Adams, never told us how they felt. John Adams never hesitated to let us know how he felt. They had but, quite a but, but Jefferson, Payne, the rest, they didn't do so. In the case of Payne, there's, you know, psycho historians that, well, he, he almost could never forgive himself for what happened to his wife who died in childbirth. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah. It was a hard life that yeah. many of these people lived. Harvey K, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, everybody. Thank don't you. That's forget. A pleasure. Do you Anytime. have like a website that people go to, or do you have a Substack? Uh, I'm on How Twitter, do... Harvey J K. That's my that's my hobby almost. And you're but on no, a lot it's of the... more serious than a hobby. It's where I no. vent, rant. No, you're a very important voice for all of us. I can't thank you enough, everybody. Thank you for uh, listening, for being with us tonight. I hope you learned some things. I know that I did. And uh, bravo to Harvey K. Thank you so much.